Okay, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the 10th Lahore Policy Exchange, which is on an extremely interesting, relevant, pertinent topic, which is gender inclusion and economic participation. We have an excellent panel here of experts, so I'll just go over their very, very short CVs, which I have in front of me. So the first is Fawzia Vakar. So Fawzia is the chairperson of Punjab Commission on the Status of Women. She specializes in women's empowerment with a focus on legislative and policy advocacy and community development. With over 15 years of professional and voluntary work with government and civil society organizations, Fawzia is recognized for her expertise in gender and race-based discrimination and promotion of women's empowerment. She has held senior management and advisory positions with government and non-governmental organizations and civil society networks in Pakistan and Canada. And she holds a master's degree in political science from McMaster University, Canada, and an MSc in international relations from Qaeda Azim University, Pakistan. Then we have Kate Viborni. Kate is a postdoctoral associate in the Department of Economics at Duke University, USA. She did her PhD in economics from University of Oxford and was also an, a Rhodes Scholar there. She has a bachelor's degree in economics and international affairs from University of Georgia, USA. Kate's research focuses on public service delivery, urban development, and public transportation and gender. She is a visiting faculty member at the Lahore School of Economics and LUMS, Economics Department. Kate previously worked on development assistance effectiveness at the Center for Global Development and on trade and development at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And finally, we have Fiza Farhan. Fiza is a young women entrepreneur featured in the US magazine Forbes 30 Under 30 list of social entrepreneurs for 2015, and again in Forbes Asia list of 30 Under 30 social entrepreneurs in 2016. Fiza represents Pakistan on the United Nations Secretary General's first ever high-level panel on women's economic empowerment along with global leadership. She is chairperson to Chief Minister Punjab's Task Force on Women Empowerment. Previously, Fiza was the CEO of Baksh Foundation and the director of Baksh Energy Private Limited. She has a Master of Science in Business Management from University of Warwick. And she has a BSc in economics from LUMS, and I just <coughs> found out that she took my course international trade way back. <laughs> so this is our very illustrious and interesting panel, and of course I, the moderator, am the token male just to ensure gender inclusivity. <laughs> so we're going to start off with uh, Fawzia Vakar. Um, we'll have 15 minutes, so the speakers, panelists are going to talk for 15 minutes, and after that we're going to have a Q&A discussion session. So Fawzia, over to you, your experiences and so, so on. So thank you, Turab, and thank you um, for inviting me to this session. I assume the language is going to be English? Yes, generally. Okay. Yeah. So um, pleasure to be here. I, as Turab just mentioned, I head the Punjab Commission on the Status of Women. It is a statutory body of the government of Punjab, which has been formed specifically to promote women's empowerment, which is a phenomenon in its own right um, because much as we want gender to be mainstreamed in everything, we still need specific measures, uh, especially by the state, to ensure that women's interests are always reflected in government policies as well as programs. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, the commission was formed in 2014, uh, March of 2014, and uh, it has a mandate for policy and legislative review um, oversight of programs of the government to ensure there's no discrimination. There's a lot of monitoring of the existing interventions of the government, as well as institutions that house women to make sure that um, the services provided to women are gender friendly, sensitive. Economic empowerment, of course, is an area of the Commission's interest because economic empowerment sort of serves, as I'm sure you all know, a source of um, power and influence and and uh, provides women a say in decision making in most cases, as we are finding increasingly. But we also find, as part of the Commission's work, um, that women are uh, quite far behind in terms of empowerment in general and economic empowerment in particular. And uh, 
the commission collects data. Uh, our, I guess our strength, I would say, in the government would be to collect gender disaggregated data uh, so that we can make a strong case for policy planning and legislative review, et cetera. And um, when we started to collect data, we found out that um, there was, to begin with, an absence of um, data in some cases, gender disaggregated data in most cases, and even when there was gender disaggregated data, the opportunity to get collated data in a form which can be used um, was rather quite absent. So we started off by prodding the government on providing that data. So we have a sense at least of where women stand in terms of economic empowerment, but also social empowerment in general. And uh, based on the information that we did obtain, uh, the commission has made, the government of Punjab has made a gender management information system, which collects data on about 270 odd indicators. And those indicators span demographics, health, education, the justice sector, when we, and when I say justice sector, sector, I mean violence against women also, as well as representation of women in these justice sector institutions. Mm -hmm. Of course, economic participation, and monitors some of the initiatives that the government has taken specifically to empower women. So in that data collection, as I say, housed in the gender MIS, which is accessible to all of you, by the way, because the idea is um, to provide access to the general public to that data so that then you, you can take the government to account for the disparities which are reflected in the various areas of a woman's life in Punjab. I have to remind you that I am uh, heading the Punjab Commission. I mean, I'm working in the Punjab Commission only and our mandate only uh, extends till Punjab. So um, that data <coughs> is um, available to all of you. Um, it has been analyzed into, the, to, into a Punjab gender parity report. Um, 2016 gender parity report was published in, two, in um, uh, last year and then uh, 2017 gender parity report is also which captures information from 2016 which has been recently shared with the government. So just coming back to women's empowerment, uh, we found that there is gross disparity. For example, one of the, a couple of figures that strike me is, um, which were new to me, when we looked at uh, the women account holders in the Bank of Punjab, because that was the bank which readily gave information, the other banks are still quite reticent, we found that just about 13% of their borrowers are women and the rest of the 87% are men. And the total, lo uh, the deposit value is about 5% of the total deposit value uh, of the women, you know. So that gives you, a, I guess, a picture of women's uh, access to resources. Similarly, we found that only 4% of the agricultural loans were given to women, despite the fact that women constitute, about 70% of the women in the uh, rural areas are engaged in uh, agriculture as a source of um, livelihood, you know. Um, we also found some interesting social phenomena which prevent women's um, control over resources in terms of women's ownership of motor vehicles. And uh, we found that only about 1% women have registered their vehicles in their own names, which does not tell us that there are only 1% women owners of vehicles. It just tells you that um, they find it easier to register the vehicles in the name of male relatives because accessing the Motor Vehicle Registration Authority, etc., must be difficult, challenging, and women not able to cope with uh, the complex institution, I guess, and the issues that confront them over it. Labor force participation, we all, we're all aware of women. Women's labor force participation in Pakistan hovers around 26%. And uh, Punjab is doing slightly better. It is uh, at about 28%. Uh, but we find that a large number of women are being pushed into home-based work, which is extremely exploitative mm. and undocumented. So while we have rough figure, figures that about 400 billion uh, rupees um, of our GDP is coming from the home-based workers, of which 65% is being contributed by women, um, there are no laws to protect, provide uh, security to them. There are no contracts, contracts, and the conditions in which they work are um, frankly alarming. Uh, the remuneration is way below minimum wage. Um, so that makes you think about what all needs to be done, and I'm 
happy to share with you that the home based workers policy after about 6 years of deliberations has been passed by the government of punjab recently only um last month actually or this month perhaps this month but at least it's the start and that kicks into place uh, that helps uh, bring about a home based workers law whereby a contract will have to be given to women who are working in the houses and at least minimum wages have to be given to them uh, and of course more depending on the working conditions various other figures and i will answer uh, i'll address those in um, the your question answer sessions but i guess i want to take you into a more um, positive place whereby initiatives are happening in uh, the government in pakistan in general but because now um, women's issues are becoming more uh, are being addressed more and more by provincial governments after devolution um, lots of initiatives are being taken in especially in punjab which houses about 102 plus million people uh, a women's empowerment package was announced in 2012 and then subsequently every two years women's empowerment packages have been announced in 2012 2014 2016 and now in fact in 2017 also which provide for specific um, interventions for example um, greater access to loans for women um, better skills development opportunities and we monitor the commission monitors women's skills development opportunities and we find that we are observing somewhere between 40 to 45% um trainees in the skills development trainings uh, being women okay. you know uh, yeah. i i want to restrict myself mainly to punjab because my our mandate is punjab and so this i am refer uh, this figure refers to punjab energy similarly um women uh, providing better uh, train opportunities for training to women um engaged in either whether in uh, rural areas or in uh, urban areas through the punjab skills development fund which uh, which provides for customized trainings uh, and keeps in um, to perspective the specific challenges of women so for example transportation which kate will um, talk to which is one of the biggest challenges for women's economic empowerment i feel mm -hmm. uh, that has been factored in by um, bringing trainings to women rather than bringing women to the training and um, um, psdf has thing has uh, factored that into their all of their trainings going forward um 15% quota for women in public sector employment a minimum of 15% quota uh, we've monitored that quota and we find that the compliance of that quota to date uh, i mean thus far is only about by about 30% of the organizations in the government also because it's hard to um bring in more women until new opportunities for their induction arise or having about a minimum of uh, or up to 33% women in the boards committees and task forces and uh, i have fiza towards my left who heads a task force you know on women's economic empowerment um there are about 50% uh, committees which um, have the minimums prescribed by the government uh, of women in them Uh, but we are a long way off and there are specific institutions where you'll probably find 1% women if you're lucky and some way you'll perhaps find less than 1%. Police has taken um, <clears throat> a significant initiative to mm -hmm. increase the number of women in that. Uh, so over the past 3 years or 4 years they started off with about 1% less than 1% women in the police they are now at about 2% women you know. So it's it is a rapid increase from our perspective because police is over 100,000 people much over 100,000 people so of that having um, even 2000 or 2500 women is is good progress for us uh, the judiciary has shown some better signs and they've uh, they have about 15% women uh, in the judiciary but uh, mainly in the lower cadres so just i guess wrapping up a little bit and then we can address more questions um there are challenges there are significant challenges to women's economic empowerment and i would say one of the biggest challenge is that we do not have the data to ascertain their uh, on the ground situation a realistic assessment of where women stand uh, also want to share that the commission is initiating a household survey household survey um, uh, to measure women's economic empowerment and how social factors impact women's economic empowerment and vice versa um this is going to be done in all the 36 districts of punjab and once we have those results we'll be in a better position to find out what is the current status uh, of women's ownership 
uh, of financial assets or assets, women's uh, ability to get, get employment, stay, uh, and then not just lateral movement, but vertical movement in employment. What are the challenges for women uh, when in employment, etc.? Because we have purposive survey within that also. But also uh, within that, uh, also women's employment in the formal private sector. Uh, also uh, trying to assess the situation of women with disabilities and women from minority religious communities. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are their specific challenges? You know, what is it that prevents them from coming out? Mm -hmm. Again, to share um, data, uh, you know, women um, with uh, CNIC, which has a disability logo on it, are just about 5%, I believe. You know, so the women, five, five, a little over 5%. So women are, with disability are not even registering uh, even though they have, uh, they need a CNIC um, to be able to access better services. So uh, hopefully, once the survey is done, it will be uh, the situation is becoming going to become more illustrative, and we'll have an idea of where we're at. Uh, there are there's lots more that um, I guess I can share at this time, but I'll probably hand over. I think I'm done with my 15% the <laughs> Well, almost. Acha, so I'll keep that we'll time. Have a of yes, and I'd much rather answer your questions rather than tell you uh, what's happening. Okay. Thank sure. You. Thank you very much, Fosia. Really interesting. It was very comprehensive. You went over all these interesting initiatives. Frankly, I didn't know about quite a few of them. But this one on data seems interesting, and possibly we can have a discussion on that uh, after the panel uh, is over. So now um, it's Kate Viborni, and Kate has a presentation to show us. Yeah, so. So, uh, we don't have to and Kate is going to talk about barriers to women's, uh, no, sorry, transport and women's mobility in public spaces. Okay, sorry. Um. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. It's not supposed to be. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. It's an issue that I'm very excited about. I think it's very important and f fantastic to be able to uh, uh, engage with some important policy makers in this space on, on this issue that we've been working on. So um, <clears throat> just to motivate, uh, to give you a sense of the statistics, <coughs> if we look at ever married women in urban Punjab, so, so women in urban Punjab, very few of them work. So only about a quarter of them work. But if you look at those remaining who are not currently working, we see that many of them, in fact, about a quarter of the total population, uh, say that they would like to work if they could find a suitable job. So uh, th there's obviously a lot of questions there about what makes a job suitable, what would a woman want and, and be looking for in a, in a job that would make her willing to take it up. But I think that that gives us some sense that, okay, there are many women who don't, cho who choose not to work for various reasons, but there is a lot of kind of potential supply uh, out there, women who are interested in working if they could, if they, if they uh, could find something suitable. If we ask them, if we look at data where it, uh, this is all secondary data from the labor force survey from the DHS, if, if we ask them why are you not working, assuming that they're not, uh, a full 40% of them say it's because a male in my family doesn't give me permission to work outside the home. Okay? So there's, 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 there's a lot going on here, there's a lot of different dynamics kind of informing this decision, but it's pretty clear that going outside of the home to uh, work, and this you also had uh, highlighted in terms of, of t thinking about the distinction between home-based work and stepping out to work is a very important one. Uh, and <coughs> echoing, I think, this, these two things are matching together very nicely, what we see is that staying inside the home to work uh, really limits the remuneration that women can access through access through their uh, supply of their labor. So if you look at women who are less educated, wor they, those who are working inside the home and outside the home have a pretty similar uh, hourly kind of way, uh, earning equivalent. But as you get sort of as they kind of get to a higher and higher education level, those who are working outside the home, they see a payoff for their education. Those who are working inside the home see almost no payoff for their education. So. Uh, if we just think about home-based work as a solution, which I think sometimes people raise, uh, it may be part of the solution. I'm not saying that it's not. And for many women, it is a, a very attractive alternative. But uh, it, it means that we're kind of severely, severely restricting the scope for uh, both economic and professional kind of uh, uh, growth for women. So 
this has a real this restri this constraint on only being able to work inside the home has real real lo uh, really large economic consequences. Um, and so what I'm going to argue is that getting to work and the phys m physical mobility on public transport and in the public space is one of the constraints, not the only constraint, but one of the key constraints potentially for, uh, for women in urban environments to access the, those better work opportunities outside the home. So uh, this is a political cartoon that came out, I think, in recent years in one of the newspapers. It gives you a sense of the kind of uh, uh, fear and stress that can be involved in that commute. Um, and just a little bit of anecdotal evidence, I'm going to get to data in a second. Uh, when we uh, went to visit a, a garment factory in Kotlakpat here, uh, one of the women that we were talking to was saying, she, so that, that factory did provide a bus to work, but at stops in the neighborhood, so the women have to come to the stop in order to board and then get to work. And she'll, she says that, you know, well, yeah, I mean, guys kind of come behind me, they follow me. That's just, that's the way it is, you know. That's the kind of the reality of the situation. It's so pervasive that people don't even question it. Um, so when we asked in, in a survey of 1,000 households across the Lahore kind of metropolitan area a couple of years ago, what women thought about how safe it was for them to, to travel on different modes, what we find is that even on the modes that people perceive as safest, uh, a full quarter of them which is the, uh, the bus with a separate women's compartment, a full quarter of them say that it's definitely not safe for women in their, they think, for women in their area to ride the bus. The bus is generally considered the most safe. Um, this is specifically prompted as uh, travel at night, but if you're gonna work a full-time job, which some people would like to have that opportunity, or any kind of uh, hours that involve coming back in the evening, especially in winter, you're gonna be coming home at night, there's no safe way to get home. Um, and so what this is, what we're seeing kind of in the preparatory stages in the first kind of uh, phase of the research that we've been doing is that there is evidence, which we're gonna, I'm going to tell you in a minute how we're exploring this more systematically, but there is evidence that this has, has economic consequences not only for the women but also for employers, which should make it, uh, if, if it wasn't already, it should make it an even higher priority for public policy intervention. So, so women are choosing jobs based on where they can get transport and what sort of transport is available to them to get to that place. So an, another worker in the same factory said, you know, I worked before at a different factory. It, they didn't offer any kind of transport, so I switched jobs. Uh, and when we, see, when we talk to employers in different kinds of sectors, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, so, when we, so looking at this more systematically through the data, um, <clears throat> we've asked women, okay, how important would, in, in a household survey, again, here in the Lahore metropolitan area, how important would it be for you when deciding whether to take a particular job or to take a job at all, that that job offers pick and drop? And uh, uh, the answers are really striking. So among those who say, yes, I'm, first we ask them, are, do you want to work at all? And those who say, yes, I'm, I'm interested in working, uh, the vast majority of them, um, you know, almost 80% say it's extremely important to me that it offer pick and drop for me to choose. If you look at those who are, to begin with, not very keen on the idea of working, it's not surprising that many more of them are saying, no, you know, even if it, I don't want to work, even if it offers pick and drop, I don't care because I want to be at home with my kids, I am not allowed to leave the house, I, you know, I am happy with the family income the way it is, whatever reason, they're saying pick and drop doesn't make a difference. But even in that demographic, <coughs> those who start out thinking, no, I don't want to work, when you tell them, oh, there might be a pick and drop, then some of them are saying, oh, well, in that case, maybe I will. Um, and so, yeah, looking at the flip side, uh, that's what I've shown you just now is, uh, tells us something about what the employers, uh, what, the, what the women have to say about this. When we talk to employers, we get, uh, from, from many of them, not all of them, from many of them kind of a similar story. So uh, uh, this is one, a manager of a parlor. That's an area where the, the business is really looking for female employees. Then they're saying, look, if we don't offer pick and drop, we know that the business is going to fail. So we have to. Um, and in the, the, in the case of an IT services firm with whom we piloted pick and drop uh, in the last year, they're saying uh, after a few months of offering it that when they recruit, their HR office is saying, look, this is, we're, we're putting this on the table as part of the package. That seems to be a factor for the women in deciding whether to join 
this firm or to take up some other job. Um, so I do, I, we're working on a survey of firms that would give us kind of more systematic data uh, <clears throat> on these issues on the employer side that's in the field at the moment, so I don't have a similar graph, but I'm expecting that there will be at least, for, based on the anecdotes and what we've seen so far in the field, that there will be at least uh, a good chunk of firms who say that this is, a, this is an issue for them. Okay, so the first part of, uh, of what I wanted to share was just to sort of motivate that I think that, that to kind of try to convince you that this is an issue that's relevant and important and constraining with real economic consequences. The second part, I just want to quickly overview some of the, uh, some of the policy initiatives that are happening already. So um, as you know, there, there, there are many different kind of public transport policies that are relevant for this. So uh, uh, the government has sort of tested out over the recent years um, a pink bus. Um, so, and in general, this sort of illustrates the idea of women's only spaces on transport. Um, the existing HOV, the high occupancy vehicle, those are the 75 passenger buses that you see riding around town, already have a separate women's section. Some of them have a divider and some of them don't. And uh, there's also the issue of kind of getting within the public transport and sort of narrowly defined um, when you're at the stop, how, how safe is the stop, is it well lit, et cetera. So if you look at, for example, the Metro bus, has a, has a separate kind of uh, uh, protected space, and that seems to be something that a lot of women find appealing about it. Um, there's also been this big initiative uh, by the government with, in partnership, I think, with UN Women uh, called Women on Wheels. I think the larger objective, if it's fair to characterize it that way, is to sort of normalize the idea of women out in the public space and women traveling independently. So this is a picture from their rally last year where uh, you can't really see because of the helmets, but I think all of the, all of the drivers of the motorbikes here are, are women. Um, so the, I think it's really exciting for me to see the, the, these sort of this effort and initiative to kind of try to address some of these issues. I want to highlight a few kind of limitations of the current policy environment. Um, so the first is that, so I'm, I'm talking here about Lahore and the Lahore metropolitan area. Many areas don't even have a, a bus uh, with, women's, with a women, separate women's compartment. So we've asked women in this 1,000 household survey, does a bus with a separate women's compartment come to your neighborhood? And a quarter of them said, yes, all the buses here have such a compartment. Um, uh, about a half of them say only some of them have a separate women's compartment. And then you know, the, uh, uh, most of the rest said, no, there's no such bus that comes to our area. And that could be because the bus doesn't have a separate section or because uh, there isn't a bus in that area. And then a small number of them uh, don't know. Maybe they don't travel much outside the home. Um, but you know, there's some suggestion from at least the descriptive statistics that a separate compartment might be enough for a lot of women. So if you look at, well, here we've asked in, that, uh, in, in uh, that same survey, male family members, what do they think about their female family members? Uh, traveling on different modes. So how do you feel about your sister, your daughter, your wife riding a rickshaw, a wagon, a bus with a separate women's compartment, or a women's only vehicle, like a, with a pink bus or uh, a pink wagon? And what we see is that um, the vast majority of men really discourage their, their female family members from riding rickshaws, ching cheese, and wagons. Um, but when you jump to a bus with a separate women's compartment, it, it flips the script. So, uh, they're, they're much more encouraging for their female family members to ride buses with women's compartments. What this suggests to me, I think what's interesting about this, I came into this, <coughs> this particular survey not really being sure because it could be that all these men are all just going to say, look, we don't want them going out. In which case we would see this whole graph looking red, right? Uh, it's not the case, at least for these, these households across the Lahore area, a lot of people, a lot of these men, they're not necessarily telling their female family members, don't go anywhere. It's don't go anywhere if you can go safely. So they're concerned about, uh, they're concerned about the, the safety of, the, of their female family members. And if, what, what I'd like to emphasize here is that if you compare these two bars, uh, the uh, response to having a bus with a women's compartment is, uh, is, is so different from a wagon, so much more positive than, than riding a wagon. And it, you know, people are more favorable about the idea of a women's only vehicle, but the difference isn't as much as I would have expected. So if we think about a comprehensive policy to try to address sort of the tra within even just the public transport uh, uh, sphere, to try to address women's mobility issues, maybe what we should be doing as a first step is just kind of making sure that these buses with women's compartments go everywhere. 
Um, there's also some significant areas of the city that don't have any public transport still. And when I say public transport, I'm not including rickshaws and ching I would consider, some people think of that as public, but I would consider that to be private. So if we think about just buses uh, and wagons, which are official and sort of LTC um, uh, authorized, and the metro bus, and in the future, the orange line when it's completed, there's still, so the, the yellow lines here also, by the way, show the feeder routes, which I think have now been launched a few months ago. But even after drawing all of that onto the map, we see some significant areas. They look kind of small, but if you know Lahore, you'll know that these are not small areas that still don't have any public transport running through them. And so uh, if, you, if you think about that in conjunction with the graphs I showed you before, which showed that a lot of men uh, don't, aren't comfortable with their female family members riding these other modes, and a lot of women don't feel that it's safe for them to ride these other modes, uh, then that suggests that these are, these are potentially pretty serious constraints that could be alleviated by adding more routes in these areas. Um, so we've made a few recommendations in a policy brief, which CDPR has beautifully uh, uh, laid out and, and printed, and it's on the table outside if you'd like to grab one on your way out. Um, a few key kind of recommendations of how, uh, immediate steps that could be taken to address these issues. So the first is, just continue expanding high quality public transport. Um, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer. We, we did a pilot in collaboration with, with LTC, the, the regulator um, of, a, of a women's only service, but one of the things we were trying to test out in that pilot is how possible is it to set a schedule and stick to it? Uh, and we found that it was pretty feasible as long as you build in a little extra time, downtime at the end of each route around, uh, we were able to stick pretty closely to our schedule and what would happen, especially in some areas, was that people get to know about it and they say, oh, it's coming at this time, I'm going to go out at this time. Why is that important for women? Well, it's important for everybody. <laughs> I think all of us would love that we know exactly when the bus is going to come. But it's particularly important for women because they get harassed at the stops so much. And so they don't like standing around on the street for a long time waiting for a vehicle. They want, it to, they want to know when it's coming so they don't have to wait a long time and, be, and feel exposed in that way. And so uh, if we can follow this, this kind of, uh, improve this sort of quality in general in the public transport system, arguably that may, that may uh, help to alleviate this constraint. Having a protected and proper stop space I've illustrated here the one from the metro bus, but it doesn't have to be the metro bus to have a protected stop space. A lot of the bus stops uh, uh, in Lahore are kind of, you, you know, you see them on the map, you don't see anything on the street, right? So there's no space where uh, people can stand, which again, it affects everybody, but it affects women differentially because men push past women, men touch women inappropriately. It makes it a, a, a lot easier for that to happen with impunity when there's no proper space. And uh, uh, for the exactly the same kind of reason, reducing crowding on the vehicles. One of the reasons that people don't like the wagons is because they get so full. Um, and <clears throat> so there's a lot we can do just in terms of basic kind of improvement of quality throughout the public transport system that could alleviate these constraints quite a bit. Staff on the transport system on how to deal with harassment and, and on the expectations of their behavior with respect to harassment. So, uh, sometimes there's staff on passenger harassment that needs to be addressed, that there should be kind of zero tolerance <laughs> policy for that. But not only that, I mean, the conductor should also be, uh, be in a position to be able to intervene in passenger on passenger harassment when it happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, anecdotally, what you kind of hear about what's the common sort of response to this is he doesn't know how to deal with it. He sort of tells everybody, tells all the parties to sort of get off the bus and stop making a fuss. Or if it happens and nobody makes a fuss, then, then there's no intervention at all. So uh, we, we sort of piloted this in that same pilot I mentioned where we, uh, we did a training of our staff on how to, uh, on, on, uh, on kind of thinking about and engaging in these issues. And to me, I found what was really striking about that experience was people said, nobody's ever talked to us about this stuff before. And not everybody in our pilot was a, already an employee of uh, transport, but there were some people on there who had been conductors for the LTC vehicles before, and they're saying, Nobody's ever even brought it up, you know? So, uh, so I think this, this would be a very worthwhile thing to do, but I want to emphasize it's not just a question of doing one training and that's it. We should be thinking about how we can monitor and take seriously the incentives for staff to be behave properly and to, uh, to ensure proper behavior on the vehicles as well. 
Um, so there are creative ways we could think about doing that, like we could send, I mean, in some places they've done things like uh, uh, send actors, send a pair of actors where maybe my, uh, the, the, a male and a female actor get on and act out as though there's an episode of harassment and then see mm -hmm. what happens. How do people deal with it? Um, that can also be used as sort of a social awareness raising activity. Sometimes NGOs do this to kind of say, hey, look, they, they act out the scene, nobody intervenes, the conductor doesn't intervene, the bystanders don't intervene, and then at the end they say, look, did you guys see nobody? Why didn't anybody do anything? Maybe you should think about this next time. Um, <clears throat> the third recommendation we're making on the basis of the first phase of the study is to think about improving the design of women's only spaces to get better value for money. So uh, there, as I mentioned, there's a pink bus. One of the persistent issues with it is that it runs mostly empty, which is not because there's not a lot of women travelers, but because mm. they're a smaller proportion and transport is all about density of, public transport is all about density of riders in one space at one time. So uh, the, uh, it's a large bus, it's a 75 passenger bus, and it runs on average with about 20 passengers at a time. Why don't we run a wagon on that route? A proper wagon that doesn't get overcrowded uh, will spend a lot less on the, I mean, when I see we, I'm obviously referring to the, the government would spend a lot less and uh, uh, reserve the same number of people. Take the money that's saved and use it to put those same kinds of vehicles on other routes. So that we, because right now this bus only runs on three routes and it only runs, I think, from eight in the morning until three in the afternoon. So we surveyed riders on this vehicle and what they're saying is, we get to work, but then when it's time to get home, it's already done for the day. <laughs> so uh, it's not meeting, it's not, it's only meeting, it's people who, who ride it, they love it. Like they talked about, we, we, it's so peaceful, there's no harassment, it's relaxing, um, but, but it's only serving a teeny tiny little fraction, and so maybe we should be thinking a bit more broadly in, uh, in our interventions. Um, so, uh, yes, I mean, we can also save money by doing things like using the same vehicles in off-peak hours for other purposes. Right now, this vehicle, when it's done, it's, it's done. It's painted pink all over, which is good for visibility, but it it's basically comes back and sort of sits in the garage. So uh, I think part of the reason it hasn't been expanded is because it's very expensive per person. There are sort of simple, really practical things we could do to make that budget go further if this is the, if this is the route we're going to go. And then finally, I, I didn't know about this uh, push with the police. That's really exciting to hear. Um, I just want to emphasize that this is about more than just public transport. Uh, women need to feel safe on the street before they're going to ride public transport. Because one thing we've seen again and again in our, in our first stage of work in this project is that uh, the, the just getting to the stop and waiting at the stop is a big issue for a lot of people. Uh, the, 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 there's not necessarily good lighting, they generally don't feel safe in the public space, and should we, should, we should be thinking holistically about the areas of policy that will help to ensure that women do feel safe uh, walking on the street. I, don't, I guess I didn't include the graph about this, but we've asked women also like, how safe do you feel it is for women to walk in your neighborhood, and it's really striking to me how I mean, the majority of women say no, they don't feel safe. And so uh, until we address that, it's not very reasonable to expect that women are going to uh, take up on public transport in large numbers. It, we have to think from door to door, not just on the vehicle. Okay, I'm gonna just gonna quickly, the third part of the, of the slide deck is just quickly kind of preview what are we doing now. Everything I've told you so far was sort of highlights from phase one. What are we doing in phase two? So there's, there's sort of two key questions that we're trying to address here. One is a quantification question. We, I've tried to argue based on kind of what we've seen so far and I'm personally fairly convinced that transport is a relevant factor for at least some people and especially for some women. But how much? How many of them and how much is that really worth when it comes down to uh, dollars and cents or, or rupees and, and peso? Uh, so we are going to do a study and we are doing a study now which is going to quantify how much does transport affect male workers, female workers, and employers, and to answer the question of how important is it really to have a separate women's only space. So I showed you that graph that said that a lot of people say that, okay, a bus with a women's compartment might be almost as good. That's just a survey question. It gives you some idea, but we're going to see in practice what do people actually do, depending on what kind of offer, uh, what, what kind of thing we offer them. Um, so what we're doing is a randomized control trial. So sometimes people call this sort of the gold standard of impact evaluation. Uh, we're running it through SERP, which is just uh, two floors up from here. Um, 
which is a fantastic institution if you haven't had a chance to get to know it. The first thing we do is we do a survey of women and we do a survey of employers. We find out basic characteristics about all of them. Then we're going to designate routes. So we have a group that's going to have female-only transport services. These are going to be pick and drop. So this is an illustration of the kind of vehicle. So they go door to door. I'm nearly finished. Uh, how much over am I? A little bit over, sorry. So just two more slides. Um, so, so these are going to be routes that go door to door because, as I said, what we're seeing is that the, you know, the, that the door to stop is a big constraint. So we're going to test this out door to door and see how much of a difference could it potentially make. Second group of routes will get mixed gender pick and drop services. And then a third group of routes won't have any new services offered by our research team. Um, and that's used as a comparison group. We provide pick and drop services of this kind for one year. Uh, then we do a follow-up survey to see well, how did it affect the outcomes. Um, that'll allow us to do a really rigorous cost-benefit analysis. I would like to emphasize this is testing and evaluating one approach, one possible approach. It's pick and drop. It's not the same as these uh, public transport services of the kind I've been talking about. But I want to make two points about this. One is. If it's successful, it could be scaled up and it could be a part of the solution, especially for some people who just aren't likely to take up public, public transport in, in any, any time soon. And secondly, the point of the research is also to quantify how big of an issue is this, which helps to inform all of these other policies that I talked about before. So it's not that we're saying, okay, we need to do pick and drop everywhere necessarily, but if we can come up with a good number here, that can help us to understand how much is this really worth to try to but do a big push on all of these constraints, the public transport, the street safety, et cetera. Those things are not very easy. Street safety, for example, would be harder to incorporate into the research design, but this will help to ha tell us how much is that really worth. Ah, that's it. This is all of us. We've had a lot of support from uh, PCSW, from many other partners who've been fantastic. Um, we've got some of our members of our research team sitting in the back and they've been fantastic as well. And we really appreciate CDPR for giving us an opportunity to discuss this with you. Great, fantastic, Kate. This was really interesting. <laughs> and I suppose it underscores. This brings us to our last speaker, uh, Fiza Farhan, who's going to talk about journey to women's economic empowerment. Fiza, all yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dharab. And uh, thank you, all of you, for this wonderful session. So after Fawzia's very spectacular research-based, evidence-based uh, presentation. My story from the heart might be a little boring, but maybe a good ending to this very exciting talk. Um, so what I have for you guys is, um, is, 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 is my story, my thoughts, and, and there's, I don't have any facts to back it. We can do a research later on. Um, but uh, primarily what, what, what I have learned about women economic empowerment the hard way, um, um, or, or, or by, 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 by doing, or by getting in the field actually, because I was never, as, as Tarab mentioned, I was a student in LUMS, uh, International Trade and Economics, and uh, then I went to Warwick to do my master's in business. I was a business student, and women economic empowerment or women empowerment or gender studies was never my main forte. It came out naturally, um, being a woman perhaps and just being passionate about the subject, and then it evolved for me representing Pakistan at a UN high-level panel for women economic empowerment. So the subject for me uh, is not a matter of research or is not a matter of uh, uh, um, you know, where I'm placed. It has evolved as I have evolved over the years. So hence, it's now become very close to my heart and it's now my passion, but the passion has also evolved as things have materialized in my life. So my, my topic is going to be primarily the role of an individual in this whole fight for women economic empowerment, all this global challenge, I would say, of women economic empowerment. Why do I say that it's the role of an individual? Um, and I'm going to start my story from there, whereby uh, back uh, after graduating from LUMS or whatever, as an individual, as a young woman, I just found it in myself to fight for my own empowerment as being a woman, uh, being a young woman graduating from LUMS, coming from a conventional family who wants to get you married off to a you know, decent household and you don't have to work. So from that fight of women economic empowerment, which at that point was a personal fight and nothing to do with the global agenda of women economic empowerment, but started off as an individual. So this initial fire um, started off on an individual level whereby I went against all my family norms to go to Warwick or to um, continue with my education before I could get married or before I could get settled down with a, you know, um, with a family. So, um, however, that, that initial fight as an individual later went on to becoming an organizational fight, then went on to becoming a global fight, now continuing at a, at a government level and otherwise as well, and it's, it continues to escalate. 
So I started off as a young woman um, and then launched my two companies, Baksh Foundation and Baksh Energy back in 2007, both working on the challenge of uh, not just women economic empowerment, but developing rural social development solutions. And women empowerment just came out to be an inevitable solution for them. So again, it came out naturally. Um, and, and, and I like to share this with people because it's not that women economic empowerment is something we're looking to solve. It's that the, the, the actual solution is that whenever you identify problems in any ruler context, women economic empowerment becomes the ultimate solution to all those problems. And we've realized this through the projects we launched in Baksh Foundation. Um, so I launched Baksh Foundation and Baksh Energy as two institutions working on microfinance and working on access to energy. And Baksh Energy was a project which was working on renewable energy in public and private spaces. Woman empowerment was not the first thing that we, ta we tapped to target, and it was not a project that we envisioned to uh, solve the question of woman economic empowerment. But when we actually went to all those off-grid villages, when we went to all those thousands of off-grid villages in Punjab and in KP, where we realized that they had no access to energy, they had never seen a, a, a light, there was no grid in those villages, we launched this whole product of, uh, project of solar electrification for them, uh, whereby within our field-based exercises, we realized that it would make the most economic sense for us to employ the women from those villages to become our energy entrepreneurs. So it was, you, you understand my point, it was not a question that women empower women entrepreneurs. Banalo. It was more of a question that who is going to be that right agent of change in that village who will enable us to identify all those solutions that we want because we didn't just want access to energy. We didn't just want economic activity. We wanted the girls to go to school. We wanted health to be impacted. We wanted living standards to be bettered. We wanted the general quality of life for those villages to be bettered. And we realized this through field experience by actually engaging with real people that it is the woman who will become those agents of change. And that's why the woman became my Roshna Bibis, and my, those women became my light ladies, and they became the nucleus of the entire project Lighting a Million Lives of Baksh Foundation, which later became an internationally certified practice that embodies access to energy and gender equality's nexus in one project. And hence it became an internationally certified project, now being implemented in Uganda, in India, and in Bangladesh. So, for me, women economic empowerment was sort of a destiny that came out naturally and it evolved in development solutions that I was working towards. So it wasn't the real solution I was working towards, but I've realized it through experience that it is an inevitable part of every development solution that you foresee. Um, so working as a CEO of Baksh Foundation, we, I, I thought that it is the civil society that is responsible for actually achieving the solution to women's economic empowerment, the NGOs, the people working in the field, the people working with the real woman in the field, the Roshala Bibi. However, that, that theory kind of changed in 10 years when I got on this UN high-level panel for women economic empowerment, um, which has global leadership uh, on the panel, and thereby the, the entire spectrum of women economic empowerment just widened by a hundred times for me because I realized that the problem is not The problem is much wider and broader than we would have envisioned. And we realized on that panel that the challenge of women economic empowerment is a very complex global problem with multiple dimensions to it, which requires multiple stakeholders to come together in a sort of a matrix of solutions. So there's no one solution that fits all. There's no one sector that is responsible. It's not just the governments. It's not just the private sector. It's not just the civil society. It's not just the informal workers or the formal workers. There was a whole broad nexus that had to be resolved to identify the real solutions towards women economic empowerment. Now this global panel is working on the strategy to achieve global women economic empowerment for 189 UN member states. And while we were discussing global strategies on identifying the formal workers, mein kya ho sakta hai, informal, mein, agriculture, mein, women owned enterprises, mein, in engaging with one of the most, a few of the most powerful women from around the world, Christine Lagarde, the managing director of IMF, she's on the panel with me. And in having a one on one conversation with her, she's, uh, she's, on the, she's been twice on the Forbes list for the most powerful woman. Uh, she was the second most powerful woman on the Forbes list and has been listed, I think, twice or thrice in the top 50. So, certainly a most powerful woman. But when you hear her story out, you realize that woman economic empowerment for all of us as individual women is a challenge that we face every day. Christine Lagarde being the IMF managing director, the most powerful force you see in the financial institutions, this is top gun, 
she uh, when when you when you hear her personal accounts you you get to realize the challenges that she has encountered as a woman herself towards this fight of women economic empowerment similarly with the other leaders that i met who we think are you know been there done that but that made me think that you know while this whole global strategy is evolving where all these these global leaders are sitting together to define what the un member countries will do till 2030 to achieve the agenda of gender equality for all and the planet 5050 each one of us sitting on that table have our own fight to fight to go through every single day being a woman right and that is i i realized at some point there that that is the reality of women economic empowerment while the while the issue of women economic empowerment is a very complex mix which requires stakeholders from the public sector from the private sector support from academia from the civil society to go down in the field because we are talking about 50% of this world's population the real solution for that fight beholds at the level of the individual each each single woman who is in any position wherever she is in any of these in any of these departments in any of these stakeholder in consortiums or in any level of society she's at because until and unless that woman there decides to sort of take up this fight at her own individual level she cannot translate that for other women in the society now that i'm 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 uh, representing this task force for the chief minister punjab and heading a task force uh, on women economic empowerment i have recently gotten to know the good work the punjab government is doing for women economic empowerment and my role as a chairperson is primarily to collectivize this good work and showcase it showcase it on on international platforms that i have uh, an association with and believe me um i i had the honor of uh, representing the punjab call for action report in march 2017 to the new secretary general antonio guterres in new york and uh, punjab was highlighted as one of the top 5 case studies of states um of political leadership which has been galvanized to work towards the agenda of women economic empowerment effectively and this is because of the club of all the initiatives fozia talked about the work the women development department is doing the cms uh, smu unit is doing um and 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 we had we had invitations from the uk government to come and share the success story of punjab for to to the uk mps and to engage with them to showcase what good work punjab is doing so the british government could learn from them on the agenda of women economic empowerment so that 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 gives me great pleasure to be able to be part of this this great movement and this great uh, movement happening within the government towards the role but i feel like kate just presented this is one small agenda mobility there are many there are many issues when and and when i'm sitting at the high level panel i don't want to bore you with those policies and i'm happy to talk about them later on or share the reports with you but there's but there's so much on the table we're talking about a whole set of problems on the informal economy level we're talking about a whole set of different problems on the formal economy level we're talking about a completely different tangent on the women owned enterprises and an absolutely different tangent on the agriculture based uh, employed women which is 80% of the task force now that's a huge equation and there are a lot of problems because when you talk about economic empowerment it is embedded within political empowerment it is embedded within social empowerment and legal empowerment so it's not just economic empowerment all the three angles tap it from one point to the other so when i sort of sit back and realize and 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 think through it that you know like the the problem is so huge how are we going to solve it the only solution one one way is to of course sit back and say the governments need to do it so it's your job they're not doing it or the private sector needs to do it it's your job or the civil society needs to do it or you know academia needs to come up with better research for me that's more of a blame game here for me i i feel and i i i i like to share this notion with as many people as i can that it is the responsibility and the onus on each one of us as an individual to take up the ownership of women economic empowerment to actually achieve the results because the problem is huge it's a, it's 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 a huge complex uh, mat matrix as i said and the solutions are numerous which can arise on an individual level or the state level or the private sector level um and and there are solutions that need to be achieved on every level to make it come together in that collective whole now punjab is already doing great work on different angles but when we club that together the uk government wants to learn from us there are other state governments who are approaching us already sharja came in for a delegation um that's that's the onus when people come together so i i i just like to for for me at the end of all of this different experience from having worked in the civil society from being representing pakistan at a un high level panel amongst global leadership of women uh, to now being in the punjab government um as a chief minister's task force chairperson 
at the end of the day, I feel that it is the role of each one of us as an individual, male or female, to take on the onus of women economic empowerment and just to reflect that within your position, whether you are in academ academics, whether you own a company, whether you work in a company, whether you're in the government, what little or big role can you play in your individual capacity to sort of put in a drop in that ocean that is required to be formed? So, um, so I'll just I'll just make it short. Leave it to that thought, and let you guys ask as many questions as you want. Uh, but this is sort of the 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 achas of my years of very diverse experience and the different hats I wear, and that's what I'm now looking to do. Um, I'm working still with the development sector, advising them on gender with the World Banks and UNDPs. They have their own role uh, with the government and with the UN. Um, and happy to talk to any individual as well because I think it's 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 something that we all need to club together to actually achieve the real solution. So, yeah, thank you. And now we have around 15 to 20 minutes for the Q&A discussion session. So what we'll do is we'll take three questions at one time. And uh, uh, those who ask the question, please do introduce yourselves. OK, so it's, it's. <laughs> Wait for the first one. <laughs> G. Hello, I am Sahim. I <clears throat> am honored to be here. I work with Kate for the last okay. three years. I have questions for Kate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, <laughs> we get so little time with, when we are working with each other, we get so little time. So I guess it's a better time to ask questions to Kate. Okay. So when you go in the field and ask people whether you would like to work or not, specifically women, yeah. all of them, of course, say, yes, I would like to work. Trust me, I, uh, it's my personal opinion. Everyone within the village, whether they are women or men, would, would say the same thing, that they would like to work. Trust me, but at the same time, they are working. They're not unemployed. We have to define how we define the, uh, uh, you know, how, how we define whether you are working or not. Yeah. I, I myself come from a very small village in Kasur. I guess it is quite possible to live within your house in, in a city like Lahore. It is just not possible to live within your house, not go outside your house. It is not possible at all when you are living in, in your village, in a small village. Because facilities are not just available in the house. You have to, for instance, if you, there, there is no sanitation system, there is no other facilities available within the house. Every household member, whether they are males or females, have to go outside home. They, they, they have to engage in work outside home. So the question comes back to how, I guess, we define whether someone is working or not. And uh, another experience, people tend to drop their uh, uh, spouses and siblings to workplace because, the because of the mobility issues and the harassment they face uh, on the transport, while on the transport. But I have a, uh, a funny, uh, uh, a funny experience that people tend to, you know, accompany them more while women are closer to their own houses and localities. But, to the, for, for instance, to the bus stop. But once they are boarded, no matter how far the workplace is, women are on their own. So perhaps harassment and cases like that happens more closer to where you live. I'm not very sure. I do not have data to back this up, but this is my own judgment and my own story. OK, thank you very much. Could we have another two? So we have, can have two more questions. Yeah. My name is Saima Muzaffar, and I'm working as senior coordinator at Comsec University, Lahore. Uh, my question is uh, that, um, you know, I have uh, I have listened to the discussion, very valuable discussion from you people. But why? Why female bosses are stricter than male bosses? Why female bosses are more this problematic? <laughs> this is the fact, and I have faced it by myself. And why male bosses are more helpful, and they are your rescuer. This is the fact. And one more thing is that the power, the main power behind every educated and working woman is her family, her father, her mother, and her husband. If these three people are with her, 
she can cross every barrier she can cross every barrier if these three people are with her her husband father and mother but usually we have seen that these three closest relatives are not are not uh, helping women they are not cooperating with them that's why when you know most of the successful ladies or uh, who have very strong careers they are single they are unmarried or divorced this is a dilemma this is a very tragic story and i think that society the closest relative of a woman father mother and husband Could this should the be uh, yeah so i sh uh, just want to say that how to change that mindset of okay. father mother okay. and women that okay. ja she has the right to do the job she is intelligent she okay. has the right to study sure, sure. to be educated sure. and how to take a lot this Sarah. problem you know how to change the mindset how to be supportive and helpful for to uh, for sure. the intelligent girls you know Indeed. so you these got, are the two questions you got the gist of it uh, i think dr sal has a question uh, thank, thank you, you. well this is uh, related to the first question i was just wondering uh, that the future of work and workplace as we know is changing i know some uh, men who are home based workers all they have is their laptop and a wifi connection and they're doing quite well so the concept of home based worker need to be explored a bit more that is my question and if i did not introduce myself i am pravesh kahe and i'm happily married to an economist <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much so the first question is for kate and uh, the other two you yes. anyone can answer those so kate go ahead sure yeah so uh, so i think there's sort of two pieces to the first question one is about sort of response bias in terms of how people respond based on how they perceive the person asking the question. And I think that's always an issue with survey data. It's something we think about a lot. Um, one thing we can do is improve the way that we ask questions. So I think the time, Pakistan time use survey is a really great, I didn't show any data from that, but we've done some nice descriptives from it that give a much better sense of like how people actually use their time. So it's not just, okay, are you employed or not employed, but, uh, what did you do so in the time you survey for example they ask for uh, the last one day 24 hours what did you do from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. etc and that gives you a much better uh, measurement of uh, of economic activity and other kinds of activity uh, and i think there's a lot of insight that can come from that i know the survey that pcsw is getting to do ready to do later in this year to get uh, to sort of focus on different aspects of women's empowerment they've been thinking very carefully about measurement issues and how to capture some of those things so i think some surveys are better than others in terms of capturing them capturing that issue but i think what we definitely do say and and okay yeah i think i think um as far as you know whether people say that they're when they say that okay yes i want to work whether they really mean that or not i agree i think that's an issue and we we were just discussing this in the survey prep preparation meeting that depending on how you ask that question you get very different answers so i think if they use the word it, uh, people were say, pointing out that if they use the word nokri people are much more likely to say yes if you say kam they're much more likely to say no because the perception around what what does that really imply like the whole package is very different so <coughs> these are limitations of survey data but that's exactly why you know that's one of the reasons why we're doing this second phase of the research because in that we'll we'll see when we change the situation when we open up new opportunities for transport to people do they actually then go and take up a job do they well first do they apply which we'll have a very good measurement of and secondly do they do they actually end up going and taking up a job so that i think will give us is one of the reasons why that will give us a more sort of uh, uh, solid piece of evidence um, as far as why are they why is it that family members drop off their uh, male family members tend to drop off their female family members close to home but then leave them to ride on the bus i think this is exactly the sort of thing that we're thinking that even women who who do participate in the workforce are constrained by uh, transport because some of them will only take a, a job if 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 it's in a time and place that the husband or father or brother can drop them all the way to the door that's a constraint for some people and so that really affects what kinds of job opportunities you have that means out of instead of having the whole city to look in you have a much much smaller area others will do exactly what you said which is that somebody will accompany them up to the stop and then get on but i don't think it's because harassment 
assessment is more likely closer to home. I think it's just that they're, they're trying to implement like a partial solution to a problem that is going to be faced throughout. So that means that, okay, I think I'll be okay up until the point that I get onto the bus um, and then, then the, you know, I take the bus ride. Then when I get off at the other end, it can be an issue. And when I come back to the bus in the evening, uh, it's also going to be an issue. But at least I've solved like part of the problem. I, I don't think it's that it's more likely to happen closer to home. That's my impression for, uh, from, from what I know. And that, again, sort of reinforces, I think, why uh, these, are, these are just sort of things that people do to adapt to a, a not a very good situation. And we should be thinking about much more robust ways that they can be independently mobile if that's what they choose uh, to do. Why are, why are women bosses me? Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, so on the mindset one, um, I, I just feel that, uh, a question on the bosses, right? So why, why do women uh, bosses are more cruel or they come out to be? I, again, I'm going to talk from my personal example, might be right, might be wrong. But I feel that a woman, it's a learning curve. And initially, a woman, especially when they're working in very male-dominated environments, they need to act a special, uh, with a special seriousness and with a special attitude to just make themselves be more seriously taken. I used to do that um, because I was working in very male-dominated societies, um, industries of energy, and I used to walk into a room with 500 men. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't laugh. I wouldn't like crack a joke. You know, I, I would try to be very serious because, of course, you need to embody that seriousness. You're a very, very strong uh, expert professional. That doesn't necessarily say you're like that, but it's just a learning curve. And once you're over that, those initial phases, you learn that you can be yourself, yet not be questioned on your competence. Um, Let's, let's not have her to so let her answer the question. Uh -huh. Okay. No, no I'm just, just going to share. Um, so initially as well, I was, when I was the CEO of Bucks Foundation, we had to get an exemption to, me, to come on board as the youngest CEO for a microfinance institu institution. And whenever I would go to such forums or anything, I would make sure that I wear a black coat or a gray coat, you know, just to look older and just look more serious and like, you know, not, I'm not a funny girl. I'm a very serious professional. And then I was actually advised, and this is true, I was actually advised by this very dear friend of mine, Tina Fordham, um, who's a global city managing director and a very senior woman. And she advised me that, you know, it's, it's, it, you're done, you're beyond that phase now. And this was two years ago. And she told me that, Fisa, you can now wear your pinks and your yellows and your whites and be a woman that you are, because everybody knows the professional that you are. So stop trying to act like a man or be like, you know, to show your professionalness or your seriousness. Um, and she shared her story, which was also similar. So I think it's a learning curve. And uh, I do hear these stories that male bosses, uh, female bosses are worse than male bosses. But I think it's a learning curve, and they grow out of it once they get uh, more secure with their professional environment. Yeah, but, uh, I just want to say that uh, uh, women boss should understand the problems, difficulties, miseries faced by our subordinate women. And she should, you know, she is more aware of all those dilemmas, all those problems. They so, should so empathize. They should, they should empathize more, more, yes. That's why the male bosses are more supportive because they, they are better than so. so could could I just jump in on this really sure quickly? Sorry. Um, I just also want to point out that there's a, a really big body of research now, I think, that, that pretty clearly shows that uh, women in the workplace get penalized a lot in terms of perception yeah. when they're tough. So yeah. when a man is equally tough, he's perceived as being just he's he's acting job. appropriately as a boss. When a woman is tough, people say, you know, I can't, you know, they, they'll say uh, 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 rude things about her, right? So they'll, they'll say that, you know, she, why is she so mean? Why is she so rude? And there's, uh, I think all of us, women included, tend to have these uh, uh, implicit biases that we're often not aware of in terms of how we perceive people differently. Even if you, as I do, consider myself a, a very strong feminist, um, you often find, and if you, there are kind of uh, psychological tools like implicit association tests, you can take the test online to see what kinds of biases you may have when you're in your perceptions. Uh, even as a, as a strong feminist, I've taken the test and see that I have these kinds of biases, at least to some extent myself. So I think uh, that's something also that we should be keeping in mind that uh, maybe we should think twice also a little bit. Any individual's results may vary, but also the, systematically we do see that, uh, that women are, are penalized a lot more when they, when they exert their authority, and we should think carefully about that. Also, I would just like to say I've had uh, like four women bosses, and they've all been fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
think I want to add too much on to this discussion, but there is a phenomenon called internalized sexism, where you grow up with certain notions of how women should behave, how men should behave, and when you're given those positions of power, then you know that you are supposed to behave in a certain way as a boss, which is a male uh, domain, basically, and I think yeah. Fizz has also spoken about it. I just want to share um, just a resource with you all that um, recently um, a women's safety application, smartphone application has been launched, and uh, I don't know how many of you have uh, downloaded it. It's a PSCA, Punjab Safe Cities Authority, and that has a particular, uh, a specific uh, button. It's uh, the women's safety button, and if you um, click on it, you can access the police directly, immediately, so there's one five where you can access the police. You can also do a perception survey um, uh, and submit it online, which will give, uh, the commission is going to analyze it, so which will give us with uh, data on how women feel in a particular phase, how safe they feel. Um, and why do they, if they feel unsafe, why is it that they are feeling unsafe? Is it because there's no, not enough lighting? Is it because there are not enough people over there? Is it because there are, more men and very little women over there? Is it just because uh, there isn't police anywhere nearby, so if they feel harassed, there's no one to report to? So if, if um, more and more of you uh, download that app and use it, well, you probably uh, all come from backgrounds where you'll probably not have to stand on a bus stop, uh, but pass it on to others also. Um, that'll help us with um, advocating for better services. You know, more street lighting, more dolphin force uh, going around you, uh, and perhaps some experiences also, because I know that the dolphin force is not perfect right now. Neither is 1-5 at the moment. They have their own issues in terms of how they deal with harassment of women also, but at least we'll have some data to begin with, you know. So it's just PSCA, Punjab Safe Cities Authority, PSCA. Please do download that application. Thanks. Great. Uh, last question was about technology. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think this is a really good point. I think it's a very interesting area for development, but I think it's just a very quantitatively still going to be, and still for the foreseeable future in, in a context like Pakistan, going to be a really small proportion of the total. So, I, I, yeah, I think we should definitely explore all of these avenues, but I wouldn't think about that as being a substitute for making it easier for women to get out of the home. I'm sure we're probably on the same page about that. Um, yeah, I'm Anum. I am part of the capacity building and training team at SERP, um, where Kate is also conducting her research. Um, I guess uh, I want to ask um, maybe a very obvious question also, and I'm sure something that uh, a lot of us were thinking about, and is an obvious response to when you think about economic empowerment, to somebody who says, and this may be a peer of mine, somebody from a rural area, an urban area, any young woman who says something like, well, you know, I feel like looking after my kids and raising my kids is at least as important, if not more, than working at XYZ Bank, and I feel like that social good um, has a lot more value and empowers me a lot more. Now that's a question mark statement maybe, but you know, that's more important than me working at a bank, at a farm or whatever. Um, it's also linked to, I think, a point that was raised earlier about how we define work. Um, so is her looking after her kids and her house not work? So there's that question. But I think what I want to ask, and this is more for, for the two women who are from the government, like what, what is our government's response to that? So what do you say as a policymaker? Are we saying, yes, we agree, and so, in some situations at least, it's okay for you to not be in the workplace, and, and that's actually very important because somebody has to raise the millions of kids in Pakistan also. Um, if we're not saying that, and if we're saying that actually economic empowerment is super important, then my question is, why are we saying that? Um, is there evidence to support it? Um, yeah, I, I want to, I'm interested in the government's position on that, but Kate is also free to. <laughs> Hi, my name is Asad Liakat. I'm a PhD student. I'm based at Serban Ideas this semester. Uh, my question is for is for is for Fiza Farhan. Um, so, in terms of in terms of, uh, I was hoping that your talk would be more about what the task force does. Um, in terms of because I've, I've seen the report of the task force. I've seen sort of uh, some of the initiatives that that have been taken, and, it's, and it seems to be the case that 
um, and, and I might be mistaken, so, 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 so it'd be good to hear more from you. It seems to be the case that the, the Women Development Department has some responsibilities, PCSW has some responsibilities, there's some responsibilities that sort of civil society organizations take up, researchers take up. Um, and it wasn't clear to me that, that, the, that the status with respect to what we're calling women's economic empowerment is at this amazing stage in Punjab or Pakistan at this stage that we should be sort of really celebrating it or sort of like celebrating our achievements in that sense instead of sort of like pinpointing exact areas we need to make a lot more progress in and working sort of more substantively in those areas. So I was wondering sort of what the role of the task force is with respect to working with different departments and sort of what the exact role the task force plays and sort of what the commitment from the Punjab government is beyond sort of celebrating achievements. I'll take the about women working in the house, out, the ho out of the house, choosing to work, not to work. It is about what, does she have the choice to work? And if she chooses to work, are the conditions conducive for her to work? Mm -hmm. And that is the only thing that the government ought to go drop the sisters off to work also. So um, it's just about giving her the choice. And the government, of course, does recognize it. Nobody wants it. There is also no assumption that women who stay at home and raise children, uh, their work is in any way less valuable. It's extremely valuable, you know. But does she want to do it? Or it's just a role that has been imposed on her. And why can a man not stay back and take care of the children, uh, whereas the woman, if she chooses, goes out to work, you know. So it's, it's just about that freedom of choice. <laughs> yes, okay. uh, so yes, on, on the task force, um, yeah, so the purpose of the task force, right? Um, the task force is a, is a, it has three key roles and I'll just be very specific about them. Uh, the first role is to integrate all the efforts happening in Punjab in the different departments on women economic empowerment, not just the women development department, which is the host department, uh, but labor, health, education, social welfare, P&D, all the efforts happening throughout the departments, Punjab Commission, of course, and clubbing them together into one sort of centralized platform. Just say uh, we have monthly meetings of the task force, whereby it's not just bringing all the initiatives on one table, but also inter-departmental uh, support happening, whereby one department needs a, a support from the other department to get something done. That all happens together at that platform. So it's an inter-department inter platform, so to speak. Um, the second very important um, uh, goal of the task force is to, for the task force to be an ambassador for the work Punjab is doing to the international platforms. And that's what I do in my capacity as a UN High Level Panel member, um, not just celebrating the work, but actually uh, creating awareness of the work that Punjab is doing to the international audience, to the global audience, um, sharing with them what Punjab is doing, making alliances, learning alliances, and connecting the dots. Uh, primarily with global, not just G2G, but uh, on any level. And thirdly, uh, bringing best practices and partnerships from the international arena to Punjab. And uh, bringing partnerships like the Sharjah delegation, which recently came, two other are in the pipeline. So bringing best practices or um, partnership alliances from international governments and international arenas to Punjab for better, uh, for uh, enabling the Punjab government to better work towards women economic empowerment. So these are the three main goals of the task force. Antonio Marastro from LAMS. So my, my question is uh, uh, related to the fact that I have seen here uh, a lot of attention given to the obstacles that uh, a woman faces if she wants to work outside the family. And one feels that if the struggle continues, especially in urban environments like in Lahore, for example, uh, over time, a lot of success may be achieved because of uh, several reasons, including you know, better technological opportunities and uh, changing of institutional and uh, uh, legal framework and so on. But uh, Kate showed a slide where it was uh, reported that there is a lot of opposition also in the family to a woman going out and working. And I, I feel that that is a much stronger obstacle. Eventually, it might be a much stronger and more difficult problem to, to solve for uh, uh, you know, uh, women economic empowerment. Because when you say that most times 
even if there are opportunities outside, and even if <coughs> all the problems outside are removed, your uh, male family members will still be uh, in disagreement with you going to work outside, then your problem won't be solved. So I was wondering if there is any, any way one could devise a policy to change that, to change mm -hmm. that kind of attitude. Are we taking more? Or? Or? <laughs> I mean, the, the, the physical evidence was discussed by, by Kate. By Kate so. Anybody can answer. This is a very complex um, issue to deal with. Um, <clears throat> and I guess one of the solutions would be um, to review the curriculum and see where is it that um, patriarchy is coming from, you know. Um, a little bit of an effort has been done to review the curriculum and revise it a little, uh, to talk about women's rights per se and uh, also talk about violence against women as such. Uh, that's the one area that um, is being worked on. The other thing is that uh, women needing to work is becoming an economic reality. And women are working, increasing number of women are working, whether um, their families like it or not. And in, I mean, w they, while they might not like it, they still want their women to work because now it's impossible to survive with one person working in the household. So our economic realities are, are changing per se. Now it's just about um, ensuring that, uh, you know, we sort of build on that uh, dynamic which is, which is existing. But um, the, the patriarchy that you're talking about, it's, it's, it's been around for a thousand years, you know, it's going to be difficult to change, we can only add to it, and the media is certainly not helping. The media is really stereotyping the roles that women should, should play, and uh, also that uh, the other woman, etc. So, tough one to crack. <laughs> um, could I add to that? Yeah. Is it on the same point, or? No, no, you can, you can add on. Yeah. So, uh, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Just hearkening back to the earlier question about the cho w people making the choice, I just want to say I agree 110% with everything you said. And that's definitely what motivates the study we're doing. I don't want to give anybody the idea that in the, st the study is motivated by just trying to push women. The idea is to uh, give the opportunity if people want it. Um, on the, the question of fa opposition within the family, so, uh, yeah, I think this is a, a very complex issue. but. First, I would say there's clearly an interaction between the two things. So part of the reason that there's opposition within the family is because of the situation outside the home. Like I think that the, what, that graph that I showed where we saw that, you know, there are a lot of men who don't support the, the women and their families traveling if it's on, on a rickshaw or a, uh, or a wagon, but they do if it's on a women's only wagon. What we see is that, uh, uh, what, to me that suggests it's, it's not universal, but it's suggestive that for some people, the reason that they're saying, I don't want you to work outside, is because they don't, they don't want their female family members to be, go into an unsafe environment. That is the transport which we're working on that's also within the workplace, harassment in the workplace, and it's all of the social stigma that comes along with all of those things. So I'm not saying that it's only because of that, but there is that interaction, uh, which suggests that the, the attitudes may be shifted in part by, uh, by making the environment by changing the environment. So it's not, they're not sort of two independent uh, pieces. But there are a lot of things, I think, there, there's, a, there's sort of a whole range of different things that can be explored in terms of directly shifting those attitudes as well. So I think one that's been, that's sort of, uh, that I think is really promising is thinking about where do we see uh, female role models in our society? And so you mentioned the media. I think it'd be really interesting to kind of do some experimentation around uh, 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 the inclusion of more positive female role models in the media that would be a that would be a really interesting uh, thing to, to to test out there's you know good evidence I think now from local uh, government participation in India suggesting that when you have you know when you force the, when you require that women go into the public space like when you for example set a minimum quota on the number of women in local government as uh, uh, Pakistan also did um, that, 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 that can have a, uh, an effect in terms of changing people's attitudes. So I think there's a whole menu of different things we can think about. Many of them will have you know, potentially small effects relative to kind of the, the size of the problem, but we should be thinking on all of those, on all of those, uh, all of those fronts and, and, and tackling it in multiple ways at once. The last one, and then... 
Just a note of caution for policy makers. I have some experience of policy making. You see, the trouble with our policy making machine is that it is essentially sectorally designed. Anything multi sectoral or cross sectoral, and it fails. And when there is a lot of pressure, they create another window, like women department, like environment department, for anything multi sectoral. But you will see these departments have very small budgets. <laughs> and the budget of the activities related to them is in the main department. Like, if you want to do something for rural women, well, agriculture department will have all the budgets. And you will have a hard time convincing them that you have something to say. So there is this problem in our uh, policy making that the departments are organized as if there is nothing, uh, nothing exists across sectors. So we need to be warned about it and do something about that from a governance perspective. I think, uh, uh, thank you very much. We've run out of time. I think it's been a very valuable and informative session and uh, a round of applause for our panelists. And now, and now I have a 15-minute lecture on the topic. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, let's go break for tea and snacks. Hopefully there are tea and snacks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.